background. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Never Again Live, uh, Israel Now podcast with Mayor and Mayor. A quick intro, and then they're going to get right on the screen. If the Arabs want a Palestinian state, let them go to Jordan, let them call it Palestine, let them call it whatever they want to. They had an opportunity in 1947 when the UN proposed a partition plan, which would have created a Palestine, not only on the West Bank, but on a great deal more. They refused. The Jews accepted. The Arabs refused. They went to war. Let them learn. If you refuse and you start a war and you kill us and you lose, you lose. You lose. You lose. Hi, good evening. I'm Mayor Weinstein from Israel Now, and I have Mayor Jolowitz with me. We're going to be talking about the latest flare-up that happened with uh, over 1,300 missiles fired on Israel from Gaza, and the response from Israel, and the question that looms over this conflict and conflicts before is the question, was Rabbi Mir Kahana right? Was he correct? What did he propose? What did he have to say? And what is the reality going on today? As I said, over 1,300 missiles were fired at Israel. BDS groups and progressive groups, they slam Israel and accuse Israel of genocide being disproportionate, of war crimes, of ethnic cleansing. There are wars that are occurring in the world. There's a war right now between the Ukraine and Russia. Over 8 million refugees are created because of that war as a result. Whatever your opinion is on that war. Syria, there's a war there. Millions of Syrians fled. Millions. This latest flare-up with Israel, with the IDF, one of the strongest armies in the entire world, this latest flare-up, where 1,300 missiles were fired at Israel, and Israel does pinpoint strikes against I believe half a dozen Islamic Jihad leaders and they damaged some storage facilities in Gaza. Not one Arab from Gaza fled. There's no refugees created from this con from the Israeli response. Mayor, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mayor. Pleasure to be with you. What can you say about uh this, uh, what's the solution? Netanyahu, he says this is a huge achievement, a success. Like, what's going on? Yeah. I've been doing this for quite a number of years. Um, and much of what I say today is something that I said yesteryear, 20, 30, even 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, I think it was uh, um, Hegel, Frederick Hegel, who first said, um, that the only lesson of history is that there are no lessons to be learned from history. Uh, Rabbi Kahana, in his own right, uh, had, uh, had made a comment which was very much the same as others have. And there seems to be a truism there. It seems that we haven't learned that lesson. Uh, Israel is concerned so much about what the world might think uh, that it doesn't do what it is always in its best interest. You mentioned right. 1,300 plus rockets. Well, the Israeli Air Force actually gave us an accurate accounting uh, just this morning. They've actually given us a specific number. It's 1,468. 
They can actually count every single right. rocket that was launched. Of the 1,468, right. they told us that 290 of them, again, a specific count, fell into, uh, into um, Gaza itself. Uh, there were injuries. There were injuries there. There were deaths there. BBC, New York Times doesn't talk about those. But God forbid, if Israel should respond, all you hear is about a disproportionate response. On this particular broadcast that you do, uh, in the past, and it needs to be said, I think, time and again, was a brilliant uh, and quite troubling short essay that was written by. Uh, Zev Jabotinsky, who might have been the greatest Zionist of all, uh, the title of it was Instead of Excessive Apology. It was written in 1911. 1911 yep. is almost four decades before Israel was established as a state. And Zev Jabotinsky comes out and pens this very powerful piece about, in 1911, that it's time for the Jews to stop being apologetic. Apologetic about their their right to exist, apologetic about surviving. And he basically said that the one lesson that needs to be learned by these Jews, and mind you, once again, prior to the creation of this modern superpower that is today Israel, his comment was, the time has come to stand up and tell the rest of the world, those who are our detractors, go to hell. Go to hell. And it's Almost the opposite of what Israel is trying to do. Israel is hoping that the world understands what great efforts we've gone to in order not to harm the enemy. And in doing so, and I'll give a couple of examples as we proceed today. And in doing so, the enemy, the Arabs, the Muslims, have paid attention. They've noticed. And because they've noticed, they've taken advantage. Um, allow me, I'll just give that one example. The one example is the story that appeared that basically said that, uh, and we all saw it, those of us who follow the news in Israel saw the video. Video is taken either from aircraft and or from drones, uh, sometimes even at night, night vision and such. And you can see the, the target that Israel is about to spike. It's all always filmed. And in this particular case, you hear the pilot say that he sees two, what he thinks are young people. Right walking right. nearby and he reports to them that he's reluctant he doesn't want to drop the strike against this munitions factory that the islamic jihad has for fear that there might be two uh, collateral damage of two young yep. arabs and israel yep. if we could hear it we could actually hear the communication and israel called it off now two right. days later which was yesterday uh, the day before yesterday israel did strike and got one of the deputy commanders of the um, Islamic Jihad that they were targeting. But yeah. this, you would think that Israel thinks that by doing this, that it somehow scores points and that the world comes to like and appreciate Israel's position. Yeah. And it's quite the opposite. It's quite, and we've never learned that lesson. What's the takeaway here? The takeaway here is that the Arabs noticed nothing new. I'm not saying anything that's real revelatory the arabs have come to notice that wow if we have children in the vicinity the israelis aren't going to strike us because the israelis are a moral enemy and so the immoral enemy takes advantage of the moral enemy by placing young children every place and the moral enemy the jews the israelis do the immoral thing by not striking at their murders right one hundred percent. It's old story. It's uh, I could say one thing that um, if Itamar Ben Gavir uh, runs with this message, that he'll get much more support than what he has right now because this policy is a failed policy. This does not provide any kind of long-term security for Israel or the residents, like you said, over 1,400 missiles fired into Israel. What, what's the response from Russia if they're fired on, or the Ukraine if they're fired on? Are they going to do pinpoint strikes? And are they, are, Do they have any commanders that are radioing back and sending a message saying, oh, 
we see some collateral damage, we're not uh, we're not going to engage. Yeah, think like absurd. Yeah, this notion. You know, the rabbi the rabbi said at one time, uh, the Jewish people need a national count. <laughs> you know, how long is this uh, supposed to go on for? Like, uh, and again, you know, there's, there is no refugee crisis in Gaza as a result of uh, this flare up. There's none. In fact, Arabs in Gaza, they're watching the strikes. <laughs> they're outside watching the strike because they know they're precision guided, and uh, uh, that's really it. Yeah. got a problem with Jewish leadership. Yeah. You, you, uh, you mentioned the rabbi in the National Couch. He actually had a, a version of it in which he said that there isn't a National Couch large enough to accommodate all the psychotic, uh, <laughs> pathologically psychotic responses that we Jews have given to those people who are unabashedly, let's make no mistake about this, they unabashedly tell us what their intention is. Yeah. There, isn't a, there isn't a nation in the United Nations among the many that vote against Israel. Among the, the, the average vote is normally about 112 to 10 to 11 with the rest abstaining out of the 193 nations. There isn't a nation there that doesn't understand what the intention is, uh, the Arab intention vis-a-vis -vis Israel. They know it. They know it because right. the Arabs say so unabashedly. Today, Today is the today on the on the non-Jewish calendar is the 75th anniversary of uh, the modern-day establishment of the state of Israel. Yeah, and on the 75th anniversary, the Arabs repeated today on their social media in Israel and outside of Israel something that we've heard for 75 years: a denial of Israel's right to exist, and uh, and the fact that they would work in order to eliminate Israel. And Israel seems to think, and all these so-called, I always refer to them as the so-called friends of Israel, believe that if you push the right buttons, if you make the right concessions, if you say the right, if you somehow put together the right, the right phrases, if you don't strike your enemy in any disproportionate manner, that the world will come to recognize that we are the good guys and not the bad guys. You mentioned uh, disproportionate. Uh, people have forgotten, and the history books are there for people to look at if they wish. The whole issue, for example, of the Allies, the British, the Americans, the Allies in, in Europe during the Holocaust, uh, when London was bombed by the Nazis, there was a response which followed. And that response came in the firebombing of several cities in Hamburg and and Dresden, tens of thousands of, let's use their jargon, innocents. Tens of thousands of innocent Germans were, were, were incinerated by the bombing because that's what the Americans and the Allies, that's what the Allies did in order for them to win a war. Israel right. has been at war for 75 years. And there is one phrase that you've not heard spoken in 75 years, Despite every victory that Israel has had against the Arabs, whether large in major wars or small in campaigns or in operations, and that that phrase is unconditional surrender. Every right. single conflict that Israel has had, in which thank God it has prevailed, even though one could make a case for two thousand and six in Lebanon as having been a losing venture, yep. but in every, in every single case, it's it's always been followed. By a ceasefire. By a ceasefire. Uh, even in Lebanon, I think it was uh, Resolution uh, 1710, uh, 1701. But nonetheless, it's always Israel is like, the, what's even more remarkable is Israel is the superpower. And we find Israel actually petitioning this, this enemy of theirs, petitioning yep. them to please give us a ceasefire and please yep. can we make it work. And if you give it to us, we'll open the gates to Gaza and your workers can come into Israel and they can work and we will ship you the supplies that you need and we'll give you the medicine, we'll give you the food, we'll give you the water and don't worry, we're not going to cut off your electricity. The Arabs are not stupid people. They are evil, but they're not stupid. 
And they have noticed exactly what Israel does after every single assault. And that is that Israel tries to find the shortcut to a quiet Middle East until it happens again. The world hates Israel. There's nothing new here. There's no breaking news flash. It hates Israel. And they're going to hate Israel as much if Israel responds the right way as they do today. Israel needs to respond the right way. Where are all these uh, weapons coming from into uh, Gaza? How, where are they coming from? Well, the, the short answer is from Iran. Right. How, did, how, are, how are they coming in? How are they They're getting in? In all, in all the various places where Israel doesn't have an ironclad uh, hold. When Israel tried to establish, and they still have to a certain degree, a blockade mm -hmm. of Gaza to try and stop on any vessels that are coming in. And they don't come directly from Iran. They're sent to different parts of Europe, and then they funnel down into Gaza. They've come in through the, Egypt, the Egyptian borders, of course, as well, and they come in. Well, we have an example. In fact, I just finished doing my own radio show earlier today. I have the news story here. Uh, I'll just paraphrase it because we all know it. It was last week that Israel announced that they had arrested a uh, uh, a member of the Jordanian parliament right, who had right. diplomatic access, diplomatic immunity, I think it's called elsewhere, where he was allowed to go in from Jordan into uh, into Israel or parts that Israel controlled be and w w without any checkpoints. His diplomatic status allowed him. And Israel stopped him and he was caught with 270 pistols, 270 pistols, a bunch of assault rifles, materials for bomb making, and an enormous amount, enormous amount of money in the form of gold. And this was all to finance the uh, the struggle of the struggle against yeah. Israel. What's remarkable is he was reprimanded. Jordan was reprimanded, and he was sent back. And he sent back. Yeah. It's a remarkable thing. Now, for those people who don't understand the severity of, let's just use the two hundred seventy pistols. We've seen what's happened in Israel when one car driving on the wrong road in Israel is assaulted by two or three Arab terrorists. Who happen to have a pistol with them and they and what do they do they'll shoot 45 rounds they'll kill the uh the mother and the two daughters of the d family and that's one person or two people with two guns and that's it right in israel in israel we, we began by talking about rabbi kahana in 1981 rabbi kahana published a book published by a major publisher actually they must go. Mm -hmm. and the twin themes of the book, They Must Go, one was his concern for the demographic numbers, which at the time suggested that the Arabs, by today, actually, by today, would actually be a majority. And if Israel didn't do something about it, they must go. Then you know, Now, that, that equation changed somewhat. It changed for two reasons. One, there was a slight, there's a slightly smaller birth rate among the Arabs. Uh, there uh, is a slightly higher birth rate among the Jews in the Orthodox community, of course. Uh, and there was that tremendous influx of, of uh, Russian Jews, Jews, non-Jews of Russia, which changed the demographic numbers. Yorm Ettinger, Ambassador Yorm Ettinger, writes about this. So uh, the new thinking was that the, democrat, the demographic concern that the rabbi spoke about which was going to take place even in the Galil, in the Galilee, uh, apparently isn't as urgent today as it was thought of then. But there was another element. That other piece of that twin concern that he had was that he mm -hmm. referred to the Arabs in Israel as a potential fifth column. Mm -hmm. Now, 1981, when he wrote the book, with the exception of a few, a handful of cases where there were assaults by Israeli Arabs, acts of terrorism, supporting terrorism, we didn't see anything which was similar to what we saw last year. Um, and uh, excuse me, in uh, in uh, in May of 2021, right. in which we saw the 11 days of the rockets. And I'll tell you the number, it's 4,369 rockets 
fell into Israel. But at the same time, we had these mini pogroms in Israel, mini pogroms in Israel, in Jewish time, in Romley and other times. Yep. Uh, yeah, there is the book right there. They must go. Yep. And of course, he was excoriated by the Jewish community. The Israeli, they went, how dare you talk about a transfer? Never mind that the examples of all the transfers that took place in the decade following uh, the world of uh, the Second World War was evidence that, in fact, a population transfer can actually bring, if not peace, certainly a period of quiet. But nonetheless, the one piece that he did talk about that was rejected out of hand was the fact that the Arabs were a potential fifth column. And um, today we see that that's absolutely the case. One last comment about this. Israeli intelligence figures have told us that the Arabs have, and I'm going to give you a number that I actually had to look it up and check several sources to make sure that it wasn't incorrect. Over 400,000 illegal guns in Israel. We're not talking about 400 or 4,000. So about 400,000. If, God forbid, there is a war that the Arabs decide this is an opportune time for us to demonstrate that Kahana was right, the rabbi was right, we are a fifth column. We will see a bloody Israel, the kind that we've never envisioned before. So, yes, the rabbi was, it's interesting, when you talk about Rabbi Kahana, his detractors, the people who hated him, uh, referred to him as, uh, as controversial, as a militant, as radical, um, as an extremist. And here's the best one, as a fascist, as a fascist. Yeah. If there's one person in our lifetime who embodies everything which was anti-fascist, it's Rabbi Kahana. Right. It, 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 it was, it was, it's the others, the liberals, who said, well, we can sit and negotiate, we can sit and talk uh, with, the, uh, with, with, the, with the new Nazis, the, the fascists. And the rabbi said, we don't talk to them, we don't, we don't demonstrate against them, we don't strike it, we destroy them. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. So for the, for the leftists, uh, the liberals, the progressives, to refer to Rabbi Kahana as a fascist, the one thing that he was not was a fascist. He was an anti-fascist. They, right. they also referred to him as a, as a racist. And the rabbi was not a... It's, it was their misapplication of the word racist. Racist mm -hmm. connotes race. What they're trying to say, the rabbi, the rabbi loved, <laughs> um, loved the Jewish people no matter what race they were. If the uh, rabbi served the Jewish people, whether they were black or white, that isn't a racist. Now, right. they can say that he was discriminatory, and one might argue that, well, you know what? Or concede the argument, yeah, he certainly was discriminatory. He was very much discriminatory against those people who thought the Jewish blood was cheap. Yes, right. he was discriminatory. Uh, but as far as the others are concerned, you know what? Maybe he was a militant, maybe he was an extremist. But we all know that nothing great in Jewish history, and I'm talking about Jewish history, going back to Maccabees, nothing great in Jewish history was ever done by the Jewish majority. It was always done by the Jewish minority. And most often against the best interest they thought of the Jewish establishment at the time. Um, as in, in Israel, uh, one would often hear, especially after an Arab attack against Jews, Kahana Tzedak. Kahana was right. Kahana was right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's tragic. And he once said, um, talking about the demographics, by the way, <clears throat> he once said, uh, uh, if the Arabs don't beat us with bullets, which they won't, they could beat us with babies. And, uh, and that was the concern. And the other thing that he said, I mean, we could spend days talking about right. his, his prophetic writings and comments and speeches. And um, what he also said was, uh, the day will one day come where, you know, I remind the audience that he was, he was murdered, he was assassinated in 1990. So quite a number of years ago, he said, one day the people will have a choice. They will either have Arafat in the Knesset or they will have Kahana. Now, yeah. he, said that, he said that in 1988, when he, the election committee and then the Supreme Court upheld his being banned 
uh, from running for office in the Knesset because they said that he incited the Arabs. And he said, one day you'll have either Kahana or you'll have Arafat. Today we don't have Rabbi Kahana, not the way that Rabbi Kahana was. Right, right. But we do, Correct. Have, but we do have Arafat. But we do have yeah. Arafat. Yeah. That's a fact. Um, you know, um, anti Semite uh, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, uh, she wanted to have a Nakba uh, event yeah. in the U.S. Congress. Right. And the leader of the Congress uh, said, no way. Uh, McCarthy said, no way, and he made sure it's canceled. Enter Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, and while rockets are raining down on Israel, Bernie Sanders facilitates it and allows her to have a Nakba day in the U.S. Congress, uh, the U.S. Senate. Um, you know, there's a level of self-hate in our community as well, and, and it's those very self-haters that were the loudest opposing Rabbi Kahana and using terms racism. But here you go, embracing somebody like Rashida Tlaib. Last year, Rashida Tlaib had a Nakba day in Dearborn, Michigan. And standing next to her was an Arab leader who was talking about that they have to use guns and knives and rocks and missiles, everything, very open about it. Uh, violence. That's who Rashida Tlaib associates with and supports. And Bernie Sanders embraces her. In fact, there's pictures of him embracing her, hugging her, kissing her. And then here, on the other side of the border, from the States, in Canada, the former leader of the Canadian Jewish Congress, Bernie Farber, on his Twitter account, he tweets out an article justifying uh, um, facilitating of uh, Rashida Tlaib for Nakba Day. Yeah, allow me to comment. In fact, your yep. audience might notice that I'm rifling through some of my papers. I did this on the radio show this morning, and I was looking for the specific quote. Rashida Tlaib did, um, we all know what Nakba means. Nakba is the, the Arabic word for catastrophe. It also is a, is a, a suggestion that uh, that the only way for justice to be served is, of course, by the, with the elimination of the state of Israel. Anyhow, I'm looking for this piece. It wasn't just that Bernie Sanders, by the way, they talk about Bernie Sanders being a self-hating Jew. The only thing that connects Bernie Sanders to Judaism is an accident of birth. There's nothing Jewish about and right. he's a vile, he's a vile anti-Semite, and I still continue to look for the thing. He's a vile anti-Semite, and uh, and he does, uh, and we shouldn't be surprised with what he does. What Bernie Sanders did, by the way, and there was a standing room only, I've got to find this, because it isn't just Bernie Sanders, and that's the point that I was trying to make. I'll find it, I guess. What I did is I found two quotations which were relevant. One was from May of 2021. Right. And uh, it was um, during, it was at the very end of the 11 days of rockets coming in from Gaza the 4,369 that I mentioned. And Rashida Tlaib was concerned about, she wanted to come to Israel, to Palestine, to see right. if her grandmother was okay in the West Bank. Right. And Bernie Sanders, and it's just something that I have to find, because it gives perspective that some people just cannot understand. Bernie Sanders comes, excuse me, Joe Biden comes out, and he, in a public announcement, and I have the whole quote here, it's just terribly disturbing, comes out and assures her. He tells her, first of all, how beautiful she is. Right. He, he tells her how beautiful she is, and he says that you have a beautiful soul. You have the fight of a warrior. We love that about you. And he starts to praise her as this, as this Joan of Arc-like figure. And he said, I guarantee you that I will check to make... He, but by the way, he referred to her as Rashid. Rashid, I guess, I guess he doesn't realize that, well, she does look like a man. But nonetheless... Um, and he said, I'll make sure that your grand mom is fine. And he goes ahead and he applauds her and he says, I am there for you. I have the exact quote. It's remarkable. And he did it again. He did it again just recently. Just recently, he comes out and he praises Rashida Tlaib. This is the president of the United States. 
Are we surprised? Well, we certainly ought not to be. The President right. of the United States, his Secretary uh, of State, that whole department, has named Hadi Amar as the Assistant Deputy Secretary of State for Palestinian yeah. Affairs. Hadi Amar right. is someone, long before he spent his time uh, with the Brookings Institute, was uh, not only pro-Hamas, thought the United States should recognize Hamas as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people in the quest to establish a state. Hadi Amar um, was funded, has been funded, the Dohar Institute, funded by Qatar, another modern right. state. Yeah. These, this is the person who has more influence on American foreign policy right now in Israel slash Palestine, and that's the way that they refer to it, than anybody else. And we're surprised right. all of a sudden. But even people like Bibi Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu, I haven't watched the news in the last two hours, so unless something changed, he's supposed to be the good guy, right? He's, he's the guy on our side. Well, Bibi Netanyahu just eight days ago came out and applauded the American administration for understanding that Israel has a right to defend itself uh, and basically said that he's always appreciated the fact that Joe Biden has always been a friend to the state of Israel. No, he has not. Right. And we are the ones who do this. We're the ones. It, this is Yitzhak Rabin offering that feeble handshake to Yasser Arafat while Shimon Peres stands behind, behind him and smiles and realizes that what we've done is we've just made our enemy kosher. That right. was in September 1393. Well, we're doing the same thing now. For Israel to pretend that the United States truly has American in Israel's best interest in mind. If anyone understands anything about the two-state solution, two-state solution is some kind of euphemism for the destruction of the state of Israel. Obviously, we understand. Um, if you support the two-state solution, all good and well, it simply means you don't like Israel. It means that you think Israel should be truncated in such fashion that it would, once again, jeopardize its own existence. It would be suicidal. For the Arabs, a two-state solution isn't acceptable either. They have rejected it. The way they rejected Resolution 181 in 19, on September, on this, November 29, 1947. They rejected it because the two-state solution presupposes two states. Two states. Right. Right. The Jewish state is one of those states. And what you, you open up with that very short, that wonderful little clip of Rabbi Mayor Kahana talking about if the Arabs want Palestine, let them go to Jordan. There's Palestine. There it is. There's Palestine. There's yep. your two state solution. There's your two state solution. But instead, it's our side that plays this language of compromise, thinking that the world is going to somehow love us, and it doesn't. So yes, the Bernie Sanders shouldn't surprise us. They are who they are. What is really troubling is that we allow them to have a voice. And I go back once again to Jabotinsky. Go to hell. Just go right. to hell. Right. I mean, we have uh, in Judea and Samaria, we have over uh, half a million Jews living there right now. And if uh, previous Israeli governments would really facilitate for Jews to, to move there and build properly, uh, it would be a lot more living there. I'm not even mentioning the uh, uh, Jewish neighborhoods in uh, what they call East Jerusalem. Um, all these communities should be thriving and growing and developed, and there shouldn't be any. Uh, we pay attention to... Uh, <coughs> The U.S. government chastising Israel about Joe Biden comes years ago to Israel when he was vice president to meet with Bibi. And uh, he notices that there's uh, something in the news about one of the neighborhoods uh, uh, that there were tenders given out for building, construction building. So he takes his time publicly showing up for dinner with uh, Bibi in order to uh, condemn Israel. We put up with this nonsense. You know, either Israel is valuable to the United States. Rabbi Kahana would say that all the time. Either uh, it's important to the United States or it isn't. And it is important to the United States. So give us a break. Yeah. Can I make a couple of comments <coughs> relevant to what you sure. just said, Mayor? Um, the numbers, by the way, Israel every year on the, uh, 
on the occasion of Yom Atzmud always gives an update as far as the demographic numbers. The number of Jews who live in, in what is referred to as Eastern Jerusalem, on that yep. side of the green line, is right. 375,000. And we, can, we know the neighborhoods, okay? Uh, yep. Okay, Kivatsev, French Hill, Neve Yaakov, Dilo, we know, okay, we know them. 375,000 people. The number that was uh, that was reached last week, the week before Yom Atzmut, of those living in the other areas of Judea and Samaria, yep, five hundred and eight thousand. Yep, we're talking about over eight hundred and eighty thousand Jews. Which, if the liberal progressive left, they have to be supplanted. Never mind. We all remember what happened in August of two thousand five when Israel had to drag out. Uh, 9,000 wonderful, real Jewish Zionist settlers were yep. in the uh, area of Gush Katif and Envires. In this case, yep. we're talking about 880,000 people. It's not going to happen. It's not. There comes a right. point where we have to say, what we're afraid to say is, uh, too many people are afraid to say that not every problem has a solution. Not every problem has a solution. It's something which most experts are afraid to say. I'll say it. Not every problem has a solution. You have 880,000 Jews living in what they consider to be occupied territories. And I qualify that because the Arabs say that all of Israel is occupied. It's interesting how uh, Joe Biden, um, Anthony Blinken, and Hadi Amar uh, all think that Israel, that the occupied territories were all the post-June 5th, 1967 borders, whereas the Arabs are quite blunt in telling us, no, they are all the territories of Israel. You mentioned Joe yep. Biden going to Israel when he was vice president. Joe Biden went to Israel last year, July 15th, and he stood side by side with Mahmoud Abbas, head of the EPA. And Mahmoud Abbas, on that occasion, turned and said to Joe Biden, we need you to help us undo the Nakba, the tragedy. He referred to it, he used it, he, he, you have to help us undo the occupation right. of, of 74 years. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah, the occupation of seventy-four years is enough for us to close the book, send the yeah. diplomats home, and say go to hell. We yeah. don't do it. We don't do that, uh, and we don't do it at the at the cost of having rockets fired again. Look, people spoke about Zev Jabotinsky was criticized in the nineteen thirties as a prophet of doom. Uh, in fact, his arch rival Ben Gurion referred to him. Um, I'm sure most of the people uh, know that uh, Jabotinsky is Vladimir Zev, his Hebrew name, Jabotinsky. Ben Gurion referred to him as Vladimir Hitler. Right. Because he was a troublemaker, because he was, what are those words? He was a militant, he was an extremist, he was a fascist, he was a, yep. okay, he was a, 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 re a rebel rouser. He was all those things. Well, he was the greatest Zionist of all time. And the reason that there's an IDF today was because he helped establish that in 1920. Um, that's when the uh, Israel Defense Forces. So to come back and you look at all this and you ask the question, have the lessons of yesteryear ever been learned? And the answer is, of course, they've not been learned. Rabbi right. Kahan, just as Jabotinsky was referred to as a prophet of doom, because he dared to suggest his famous you know, quote, liquidate the exile before the exile liquidates you. Exactly. Of course, that there's a Holocaust that is impending. Mind you, he died in 1940. He never really got to see how how, how right he was, which is tragic. Yep. But he, he talked about this impending doom. If the Jews didn't do two things. One, go to their homeland at whatever cost needed to be paid, and two, to fight at whatever cost needed to be paid. Yep. He was considered a prophet of doom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, Rabbi Kahana, in his own time, was also referred to as a prophet of doom. Yep. He talked about the fact that if we didn't somehow solidify as one people against this enemy, which was everywhere around us, that we too would have something to worry about. Um, the lessons are never lost. When you and I do this show in 10 years, Mayor, we'll be talking about the same things. We'll be talking about the same potential fifth column. And God forbid, it might even be uh, much, much, much more right. dangerous than right. this day. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, what should be in Judean scenario more development, let me give you an example. 
<clears throat> something that really a lot of things troubled me about uh, the pace of the uh, construction and the permits and the delays and all that uh, nonsense that goes on. Uh, Hebron. Hebron is the second holiest city to the Jewish people. Uh, the Jewish area that's designated, it's not developed. I mean, I remember Miriam Levenger uh, in a uh, interview, I think in Life magazine years ago, in the 80s, uh, she talked her vision for uh, Hebron of thriving. You know, there would be malls set up, there would be uh, apartments set up, nice ones, hotels, a thriving city for Jews, which it should be. And by the way, right next to it uh, is uh, Kiryat Arba. That should be, because it's attached to Hebron, should be really a major face with for for that, that it should be fully developed and hotels and everything that Jews could visit Hebron and really understand the significance of it, just like they're visiting uh, Jerusalem, where you have the Mamilla Mall, where you have the attachment to the Jaffa Gate, where Jews could uh, could go in there. And you got the Jewish quarter developed, but you don't have any proper development going. There's a pizza stand in Hebron, a pizza stand. How ridiculous is that? Uh, again, it's got to be welcoming for Jews, and not just once a year that we go on uh, uh, Parsha's uh, Hayasera, uh, and tents are set up, and this person putting up that person, and so on and so forth. No, it's got to be thriving. And while I'm on this topic about uh, Jewish communities that have been fully neglected by every single government of Israel uh, that's been in power, the whole so-called controversy of the neighborhood in Jerusalem, Shimon Hatzedek. You know, I've walked by there so many times when I've stayed at uh, hotels. I used to stay at the Novotel Hotel in uh, in Jerusalem. And on Shabbat, I'd go from there to hop, skip, and a jump to get to the Damascus Gate to walk to the uh, hotel. Uh, I know where Shimon Hatzedek is. It's just uh, almost across the road where those three hotels are. And, uh, you know, and also if you're using the route through Mayish Harim to go to uh, the Kotel via the Damascus Gate, you're passing through Shimon Hasidic neighborhood. It's, you know, there are neighborhoods in Israel, all over Israel, where they call them mixed neighborhoods, Jews, Arabs. Oh, so you don't want Jews living there in Shimon Hasidic neighborhood. We have to get rid of the Jews. It's an absurdity. And until the government of Israel and the people in power and the rabbis too speak up properly on our, our not only our claims, but really the truth of the matter without being apologetic. That's it. We have, uh, just like we said earlier, a national couch. Got to get rid of that. now, or, or sit down for a moment. Let's sit down, have a discussion with the nation. And then rise to the occasion and do what we have to do. Because the result of not doing what we have to do is emboldening the enemy where they feel fine to fire over 1,400 missiles. And then there's a ceasefire. And they're going to regroup and rearm. And then there's going to be another round. And what are we going to do? Pinpoint strikes. Yeah. Can I bring up the rabbi again? Yes. I know that was sort of the cornerstone of what we were going to discuss. On July 31st, I know this well, I was the head of the, I was the national chairman of the Jewish Defense League at the time. Mm -hmm. On July 31st, 1982, the, yeah. New York, the New York Times did something which they'd never done before, and I don't believe they ever did again. They actually gave an editorial, an op-ed space for Rabbi Meir Kahana to write an op-ed. Usually the New York Times was writing about Rabbi Kahana. Right. And once again, you know, all the same thing as radical, right winger, fascist, and all. In this particular case, uh, it was uh, also the time of the, um, the war in Lebanon. But on July mm -hmm. 31st, he wrote, of 1982, he writes a piece which appeared in the New York Times. And mind you, there's a word count. I don't know if it's 850 words, and you're limited to that. So you have to be sort of economical about what you say and how you say it. And the, the name of the, the, the title of that particular op-ed that appeared on the editorial pages of the New York Times was No Guilt for Israel. No Guilt for Israel. And he basically talked about the fact that Israel should feel 
no reason whatsoever to be apologetic about the fact that it exists, about the fact that it survives. In, a, he's, in essence, he was almost, not that I was suggesting, he was almost parroting what I had mentioned before, that 1911 piece that the Jabotinsky had written instead of excessive apology. And he basically yeah. said, we have nothing to be apologetic about. We have everything to be proud about. Go to hell. The piece was a fabulous piece. It was so fabulous that there were a number, this is the remarkable thing, there were a number of Jewish publications in America that ran the piece syndicated yeah. without his name. Oh, wow. Without, this is the thing, without his name. Yeah. And they ran it without his name. So I contacted one of the publications, a major Jewish publication, a major Anglo-Jewish publication. And yeah. I said, by the way, I said, uh, um, who wrote that piece? And they <laughs> said, wait, and they said, anonymous, anonymous. Now, it was wonderful enough. It spoke about Jewish pride, part of Israel. The fact that Israel, after 2,000 years of exile, could actually stand up and it doesn't need the United States and can do what it needs to do. It'll defend itself and the enemies better beware. And there were apparently quite a number of Jewish voices in America, the same people who detested everything that they thought the rabbi was all about, who basically found, so what did I do? I took that particular piece, having learned the lesson, and I sent it to a number of American Jewish Anglo publications. And I, I, kept, and I put, Anonymous. I yeah. did anonymous. And they all published it. They printed it. It was remarkable. When I later contacted them and said, by the way, there's a mistake. That was that was Rabbi Mayor Kahana who wrote that piece, No Guilt for Israel. They said, Oh yeah. my God, had we known we wouldn't have published it. If that alone doesn't tell you where we are, uh, quite often Itamar Ben Gvir is disliked by a large portion of Israel, I shouldn't say large, but a significant minority of Israel, not because of what he says, it's because of who he represents. Right. It's who he represents. Right. For, a, for, a, for a Jewish attorney to stand up and say, I think it's only right that Israel instituted a death penalty for Arab terrorists with blood in their hands, and for someone to say, no, this is Itamar, this is Kahanism, it actually isn't Kahan. And, and the rabbi, by the way, responded quite strongly to this charge that we heard all over the world of this new Kahanaism. And he responded by saying, a lot of what you decry is Kahanaism. He says, I'd love to take credit for it. I'm not a plagiarist. It's Judaism. Yeah. It's Judaism. That's what it is. Um, and we all remember, without going into detail, that when he was banned, and upheld by the Supreme Court in 1988 when he was running for the Knesset, because all the public opinion polls showed that he was going to get between 11 and 13 seats in the Knesset. There all it is. Banned. He was banned. So was Mohammed Mayeri of the Progressive Peace Party. Those Arabs, they really know how to pick the names of their party, the Progressive Peace Party. Right. And he went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court upheld the banning of Rabbi Kahana, but not of the Progressive Peace Party, which was a party which was loyal to to Arafat, the Progressive Peace Party of Muhammad Mayeri. And right. the, that's when the rabbi came out and said, one day you will have Arafat uh, sitting in the Knesset. And that's exactly what happened. But the reason he was banned was because they didn't like that he was the one saying it. When he was asked to submit his defense of the charge of race, of, excuse me, of incitement against him, he did something very clever. He was a very very clever man, a very sure. clever man. Yes, um, as sophisticated as anyone we've ever seen in his manipulation, and I mean that in a positive way of the media. And he came out and they asked him to submit his takanon, the uh, articles of the, the articles of uh, uh, the mission statement, the mission statement for the party for Nuwat Kach, for the Kach party. And the rabbi very cleverly had a lawyer submit. Uh, the Takanon, which included the Rambam, Maimonides, 13 principles of faith, which every Jew who prays Shacharit in the morning all over the world recites the 13 yep. principles of faith. The rabbi had his lawyer submit that to the court, and the court, and mind you, the people on the, in the courts, they're smart people. 
They, they have no common sense, but they're intelligent people. Uh, and they rejected the Rambam's 13th principle of faith, saying this is racist. This is ra And that is the truth about the conflict and the fight that we fight in Israel today. Right, there are two right. wars. The one is external and one is internal. And the internal one isn't about judicial reform. Judicial reform is a footnote to what the struggle is really about. It's about whether or not Israel will have a Jewish soul and a Jewish destiny. And all those who were against judicial reform, mind you, prior to BB submitting, they were for a measure of judicial reform. Yep. Previous prime ministers also thought that the power of the Supreme Court needed to be curbed. But it's because it came from a particular political ideology. Yep. And the lesson to be learned here is, let's look at what the struggle is really about internally. It's about the fact that these people, the progressives, call them what you wish. They don't want Israel to be a Jewish state. They, right. they recognize the Arab concern when the Arabs said, I don't want it to be my national anthem. I don't want the Star of David, the Star of David with the two blue lines indicating the Talit to be. That is a, and they find empathy with this Arab call for the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state. That, Mayor, and you know this quite well, that is what the struggle is all about. And that's what the rabbi would bring to our attention. Just one last thing. I see the clock is ticking, but I will say this. Um, the rabbi was in court in Israel many times. He was in court in the United States many times. The, the, the rabbi was, I'll give him, yes, he was a rebel rouser. Yes, he was a troublemaker. My God, I wish we had more troublemakers during the Second World War fighting for the Jews who were being slaughtered. Yeah. Those are yeah. the type of yeah. Yeah, Yehuda Maccabee was a troublemaker. We Okay, we right. understand that. The Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising were troublemakers. That having been established, one of the times that the rabbi was in court in Israel, being charged with one of many things, incitement and this, and he was uh, accused by one of the judges who he was standing before of inciting the Arabs. And the rabbi said something which we all remember. Uh, he pointed to that symbol behind the the judges, uh, that emblem of the state of Israel, that famous emblem that has the menorah on it. And he yep. said, that is the incitement to the Arabs. And he said, right. the flag that I walked on the flag post, that I walked past on my way here into this courthouse, that Israeli flag, that Jewish flag flying out there, that is incitement. And he said, it's not Rabbi Meir Kahana who incites them. It's the very fact that there is a Jewish judge referring to the one he was speaking to, sitting in a Jewish courtroom in Jewish Jerusalem. That is what incites them. And the other side will never give us that very, very real truism that that, that is what Zionism is about and that is what Judaism is about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, last night in Tel Aviv, there was a rally. <laughs> There was a rally, an anti-government rally. They were waving communist banners and PLO flags in Tel Aviv last night. And what you said is absolutely correct and it fits. And that's that's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how much more there's really to say. You know, we, we said, you know, Rabbi Kahana was right. Absolutely. The answer to the question, was he correct? Was he right? Yes, Rabbi Kahana was absolutely right. And Israel has to be a Jewish state. And the enemies of Israel should fear the IDF. And when Israel engages in a conflict, that they're firing missiles at, at Israel and they're arming themselves, go in. Uh, do what any normal army would be doing. Put the fear of God in them, and if they flee because of that, they flee because of that. Yeah. And uh, the the mindset has to be the protection of Israel as a Jewish state. Fully. You want peace? Anyone wants peace? We're ready for peace. Anyone's a, a bullshit artist, and uh, they're just trying to trick us? Forget it. Uh, we'll call you out, and we'll take matters into our own hands, and do what, do what any normal country would do. Yeah. Um, just one last word about the rabbi. I mentioned uh, also uh, with a parallel of Jabotinsky, the prophet of peace, whatever. 
um, a number of the rabbi's supporters said to him what Jabotinsky before him heard, and they said that he was prophetic in his writings. He was prophetic that everything that he wrote about then, many years ago, came to be true. And the rabbi responded to many of these people, these are supporters of the rabbi, by saying very much the same thing that Jabotinsky said when he forecast the tragedy that was about to befall the Jewish people in Europe. And he said, there's nothing prophetic about me, Jabotinsky said then. He said, what, what do I see that you don't see? We see the same thing, that the, 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 the conditions were happening in Europe which was going to lead to what we ultimately came to, to know as the Shoah, the Holocaust. And he said, there's nothing prophetic about it. Look, the handwriting is on the wall. And when the rabbi was asked, you know, you know you're so prophetic, why prophetic about the whole issue of the Arabs and everything else, talking about the population. And he said basically the same thing. There's nothing prophetic here. Open your eyes. Listen right. to what they say. One doesn't have to be a prophet. They're telling us what they plan to do. And we watch yeah. and we watch Jewish leaders be anything but leaders and just allow right. it to happen. Uh, Mayor, I know right. the clock is ticking. There's a quote that I pulled out in anticipation of doing yes. this with you. If I can, it'll take sure. a minute to read, if I could read this. Absolutely. It's a, Absolutely. It's a, it's a powerful thing written by the rabbi. Uh, he wrote this years ago when he believed that there was a certain um, weakness of spirit for those who needed to fight the fight against Israel's enemies. And I'm going to read you the words that he spoke then. And these are words that perhaps uh, today need to be heard more than any others. It's a warning against our allowing ourselves to lose our resolve. Here's what he wrote then. Not all Jews are heroes, and there are those who grow weary of the long struggle and the longer wait. And weariness carries with it weakness, weakness of the body and weakness of the spirit, weakness that persuades the Jew to believe that which just yesterday he knew to be nonsense, weakness that prepares the ground for the Jew to believe in madness and, and in illusions. This notion of peace with an, en with an enemy, an implacable enemy that tells us what its intentions are which is the destruction of the Jewish people, for us to all of a sudden try to find a silver lining and believe that by our behavior, by not bombing a Islamic Jihad um, munitions station because there might be two young Arab children in the vicinity, and everything else, the madness that we see, that is the illusion that leads to, people talk about two-state illusion. In most of the speeches that I give, one will see me take the thread from a two-state solution to two-state illusion to two-state delusion. And tragically, we, the people that are thought of as so smart, um, have proven quite the opposite. They've proven the, the myth of Jewish intelligence. No, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Uh, Look, we're living in a time when God determined uh, the Jewish people are going to have a Jewish state. And, you know, the war, the, six, uh, the 48 war, miraculous, 67, miraculous, no question, signs from God, similar to leaving Egypt uh, under Moses, and whether Jews want to wake up and realize and do what we have to do. And appreciate it and be proud about being Jews and our Torah and everything about our faith. Uh, that's it. And that's our ideology. And it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, and Muslims don't apologize for setting up an Islamic state and all their different uh, Islamic states that they have. Right. One Jewish state right. in our land. Our land, not somebody else's land. We don't want anybody else's land. We want our land. That's it. And fortified. Yeah. Well, um, history is normally written by the victors. 
In this particular case, I don't know who's going to end up writing the history that we speak about today. But if there's any intellectual integrity whatsoever, the man, the myth, Rabbi Meir Kahana, uh, has a special status in Jewish history. There was a dispute philosophically called the Great Man Theory. In the 1840s and 1860s, Thomas Carlyle and Herbert Spencer, going back, time doesn't allow me for details, but they talked about, is, is, does man make history or are the circumstances of the, that surround him what makes the man? Now you take a Churchill. You know, would Churchill and any other envine have been that great statesman that he was that saved the world against Nazism and on and up? So that great man theory, Spencer and Carlyle fighting it out. The one thing I will tell you, you talk about does man make history or does history shape the man? I knew him quite well. You knew him quite well. Rabbi Kahana shaped history. Mm. He shaped history. There's no question about it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, there's no question about again, it. Yeah. I thank you again for the opportunity, Mayor. It's an important uh, thing to talk about. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to ask everyone who's, who's watching, if you could please share this on whatever platform you use, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp groups, email lists. Please share this. It's available on our website, israelnow.ca. It's available on our YouTube channel, uh, Never Again Live. It's available on our Twitter, uh, Never Again Live as well, and uh, available on our Facebook page. Uh, please share this. We'll reach a lot more people. This is very important. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Jowitz, for joining us. And we'll have more shows moving forward. We'll speak the truth. We'll share the truth. It's so important for the Jewish people. Shalom, shalom. Thank you very much. Thank you.